when no coal yard is going to be open, no truck is going to haul a load of coal, and not a single basket of coal is going to be carried up, no matter how many flights of stairs on anybody's shoulder, until the bosses settle with the union. In no time at all, the pickets ran up against the cops. Now, it didn't become a clash of the kind we're going to the workers and walked around and gave their orders as though they're supposed to be obeyed and the workers didn't pay any attention. Uh, you could say in a limited sense it was a form of civil disobedience that hadn't quite yet got to the area of self-defense as was going to happen in just a few weeks in, in another and larger situation. A few loads of coal were delivered, but the whole, the whole battle was waged by the militant pickets in such a way that it became crystal clear that the, that the bosses and their minions of the police were going to have to club down a whole lot of coal yard workers before they were going to break the strike and get back to normal delivery. Meantime, the temperature is down between 30 and 35 below zero. And orders are pouring into the coal, uh, coal company offices, and they're getting very nervous. The upshot of it was, between these two factors, that the bosses agreed to settle. They gave what amounted to a qualified recognition of the union and that was tied in with the format of the time a collective bargaining election conducted by the national labor relations board to determine whether or not the union would represent the workers now it wasn't it wasn't much of a gain from the point of view of the material conditions of workers in the settlement. But it was a strike with limited aims. The aim was to establish the union in this area and get set to take the battle on to a new and higher and broader stage during the summer, and then we would return the following fall when it got cold and we would mop up the loose ends in the coal yards. That was the intention. And it was a only a partial victory, but a very important victory in the sense that it was a victory in what was the first major strike, magnitudes being relative, that had not been defeated since the year of the blue snow in, in the city of Minneapolis. And yet, you should have seen the settlement meeting. The, all the bureaucrats of all the unions around town had been, had been oh, about as nervous as you can get while this battle is going on. Who knows what's going to come to the union movement, you know. This kind of stuff starts. <laughs> and so the, uh, the uh, question come of voting on the settlement. They had farmer labor aldermen from the city council. They had the secretary of the Minnesota Federation of Labor. They had the organizer of the Central Labor Union. They had a judge that was called a friend of labor. They had a personal representative of Bill Green who happened to be in town. And, and they paraded one after another before, uh, before this body of workers, extolling the virtues of this contract and this magnificent uh, victory. You'd have, thought, you'd, you'd have thought it was virtually the second coming of Christ. The way, the way, the way they uh, painted the thing to the workers, and the strike was settled. Now the bosses had their own ideas, and they weren't unanticipated by the real strike leadership either. The boss's idea was, all right, we got to get this coal moved. It's cold. We can't break this strike quick, but the season will be running out in another month. We'll, uh, we'll chop off the red hots and we'll have this whole thing house broken and back to normal before we get into serious business the, uh, the next fall. 
And the coal yard workers are no more than going back into the yards. And even before the election is held to prove that the workers wanted the union to represent them, which it proved, the bosses begin to take reprisals by firing those who had been the more outstanding uh, organizers and millers. I mean, organizers in the voluntary sense of workers on the job helping to organize other workers and those who had played one or another militant role in the strike itself. But this act on the part of the bosses boomerang in part because there were a lot of militants in the coal yards that really meant business, and in part because it was, it was a life or death question for them. If they didn't go forward and help deepen the momentum of the whole union drive and, uh, and, and expand the whole struggle, they didn't have a prayer of getting back into a coal yard again, and where were you going to get a job in those times? The result was that as the <coughs> bosses began to fire the coal yard militants after the strike settlement, Local 574 began to get an increasing body of volunteer full-time union organizers. And <coughs> at the same time, something else had happened. When all the yards were organized, already at that level, the tight craft structure of the kind I sought to describe to you had been cracked open in that every, everybody who did anything in any way, shape, or form who wasn't a boss, didn't have, the criteria was, if you got the, if you got any authority over hiring and firing, you got no business in union. But anybody who didn't have the authority to hire or fire, worked anywhere around the setup, he's in. And they all wanted in. So in a, in a limited sense, but in a very significant sense, we had cracked open, already in the coal strike, the tight craft structure that had been knit, and had laid the basis for the development of the general descriptive concept of how we were going to organize the whole trucking industry and all its environs, and as they say in uh, Paris, it's purlieus too, in, in, the, in the generalized phrase of drivers and inside workers. This became the, the formula around, around which the, uh, the, the, the whole campaign was conducted. Also, the victorious coal strike, as you would anticipate, had set a very important tone of confidence among the workers, opening the way to a general organize, uh, organizing drive. And having seen this transpire, the unorganized workers throughout the whole trucking industry of the city are ready for action because they too are being goaded by the same intolerable conditions that had driven the coal yard workers into action. And they had seen demonstrated before their eyes a proven means to, to uh, advance their wages, to better their conditions and begin to redress some of the grievances that they'd had in their craws for a long time. And the consequence was that all over town, the workers in and around the trucking industry began to respond in strength to the general organization drive. And the stage was now set for a major class action to be constructed through the formal, to be carried out through the formal structure of what had been a typical class collaborationist craft union and that under revolutionary leadership. Now, at this point, I might observe, as, as will be demonstrated by what is to follow, that in appropriate circumstances, it is not necessary to hold formal office in order to lead. It is possible in appropriate circumstances to move in where there is a leadership default and seek, as was undertaken in using the wedge of Brown and Frosig in 574, to exploit 
cracks in the official apparatus and how it comes out is going to be determined not by the form of things as they have existed in a union at a given juncture under, 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 a, under a given set of, uh, of precedent historic circumstances. How it comes out is going to be determined by the dynamics of the class struggle. And in this respect, the cadres that had been forged in the organizing drive in the coal yards blooded for battle in the short, sharp, and sweet coal strike of February 1934 and made full-time volunteer organizers by virtue of the fact the bosses began firing them as soon as they went back into the yards after the strike, that a cadre had been forged among some of the best militants in the trucking industry that were going to become a decisive force in the fights that were to follow. They were to serve as the vital core of the Union as we headed into the first of the general strikes of the truck drivers that was to follow in May. And as we went into that strike and on into the second general strike in July and August of the same year, this basic cadre of Union militants, I'm not talking now about party militants, I'm talking about Union militants, were being reinforced by their counterparts that were coming into the Union and onto the picket lines and into battle from all sections of the trucking industry. In the meantime, another change is taking place. After the coal strike, a volunteer organizing committee was formed. It was made up of a, of a democratically selected body of militants from among the coal yard workers, but the selection was made in a meeting where the business agent wasn't present and his permission wasn't asked, plus Brown and Frosick. Now this voluntary organizing committee, as you will see in our talks, uh, in our discussion tomorrow night, was soon to become the actual leadership of the union. The official executive board of the union was going to be pushed into a minor role and the antagonisms of the bureaucrats in 574, in the Teamsters Joint Council, in the whole AFL movement of the city were to be counteracted through the development of union democracy in the organization drive and strike struggles that were coming. Now, it was through, the, through an initial stage in the introduction of union democracy that one, of the, uh, one major impetus was given to the organization drive. As we go along, I'm going to return in one and another context to this question of workers' democracy as it is manifested in terms of union democracy and these struggles that follow. But I want to note just this one factor at this juncture. <laughs> the workers knew what they wanted in material terms. The workers had a rich practical knowledge of the industry and they had an equally thorough knowledge of all the boss tricks. And the device that gave a great impetus to the whole organizing drive on top of the example of the victorious coal battle was the work of the Volunteer Organizing Committee in calling a whole series of meetings of workers coming into the Union. They'd be asked to come down, we want to talk to you about joining the Union, or we would go out, we would go out to the garages, to the, uh, to the freight docks, everywhere. And we would talk simultaneously about joining the Union and we'd get them together and we'd talk about what ought to be in the demands we give the bosses. And the workers themselves made the decisions and with the, uh, a little generalized guidance from the leadership uh, ar arrived at, uh, at, a, at a reasonable degree of uniformity for minimum demands to be made on wages, hours, and conditions that they were going to fight for. And this is what the union meant to them. <laughs> 
All the leadership had to do was just add a few key clauses, such as union recognition, guarantees against discrimination, and so on. And with that process well underway, the demands were submitted to the bosses, and the bosses very quickly and very emphatically made it crystal clear that they had no intention of dealing with the union in any way, shape, or form. And now it was up to the leaders, the unofficial but actual leadership of the voluntary organizing committee to steer the workers in a fight for these union demands. And tomorrow night, we'll take up the battle that followed. <clears throat> now for a question period, so if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Farrell about this portion of the strike that he spoke on, or some of the material to come, why the floor is now open for such questions. Howard? Yeah, I can see um, the reason why this strike with employer doesn't have to um, have to be graduate university strike, but I'm, I'm thinking right now of the UAW strike where they just sit and um, the impression I have is that he's going to strike off one of the three auto producers. I, mean, I was just interested in um, if you could tell um, whether that's the wisest policy or whether it would be better for us to um, get all the auto manufacturers if they're going to strike. Well, you'd have to look at that question from the dual point of view of strategy and tactics. The difference between what we were doing then and what Ruther is doing now is, is that the strategic aim was to facilitate the mobilization of the workers and leading them into battle for demands which the workers themselves uh, set down. Strategically today, Ruther's notion his whole policy, his whole concept is to prevent in every possible way direct struggle by the workers at the point of production and in those situations where he is forced into giving some kind of lip service to uh, uh, doing battle against the bosses, he begins by the opposite of the policy I described of letting the workers shape the demands, he maneuvers around to, to frustrate and defeat the workers' demands. The outstanding example is the, is the consistent refusal of the Ruther leadership in the UAW to make a battle for the 30-40 demand, the 30-hour week at 40 hours pay, which would be fundamental to improving the, the uh, job situation in Otto, to try at all possible hazards to prevent a strike, and if a strike takes place, to settle it just as quickly as he can. See, there's that difference in the strategy. Now, when you come to the tactics, it does not necessarily follow that it is, it is at all times and in all circumstances a best, the best tactic to strike them all. As a matter of fact, on Friday night, when we talk about the battle in 1941, where the objective situation is beginning to change, uh, I will indicate how we resorted to selective strikes and were very careful uh, how we picked and chose the place that, that a strike would be initiated because we were up against a qualitatively different situation. So if you want to take the question of a limited strike, as against a broader strike, if you take it strategically, the tendency to limit strikes is, is a facet of the tendency to try to prevent class struggle so far as possible. But in tactical terms, you don't say categorically in advance that at, at all times and in any and all circumstances you would strike every boss at once. That's a, that's a question that has to be determined by a series of factors in, in a given situation at a given moment. <coughs> Maybe I sit over here a little more. Uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, 
in the coal yards. Were there uh, any Negro workers there? If so, um, how was the situation handled? And secondly, what was the uh, attitude of the official Congress party towards the coal yard strikes? Uh, on the first question, there were no Negroes in the coal yards. As a matter of fact, uh, there was, there is now not a very large Negro community in Minneapolis, and in relative terms, it was much smaller then. And uh, there were scarcely any Negroes employed in the trucking industry. Um, the the only area where uh, where there was even a small Negro representation was in the taxi industry. Would be commensurate with the, the whole situation in which the the uh, Negro uh, workers, the last to get a job, he gets the worst, and so on. And uh, they, there were there were for those reasons in that in that actual setting very few Negroes involved. Insofar as there were Negroes present. Uh, uh, they were an integral part of the union from the outset, and uh, uh, there was a, uh, I won't say that there wasn't a good deal of anti-Negro prejudice among the white workers, there was, but uh, at the same time, uh, in the struggle atmosphere and with a conscious leadership, there was absolute equality for Negroes. Uh, now, on the second question, if you'll permit me, uh, I intend to talk about the role of the Communist Party, but tomorrow night, and take you through a general strike before we, uh, before we, uh, we talk about the role of CP, because that's where it really begins to be driven home. And then I'll take it up again later when we come to the fight in 1941. I'll return to the question of the Communist Party in two different contexts. I think it would be better to do it that way because I think it will have more meaning if it is taken up in terms with some, some larger, more deeply significant uh, events that will be taking place. <clears throat> did not discourage them from joining. The situation was this. There was, there was a very small proportion of Negroes relatively in the town, a small Negro community. Uh, as I said, very few Negroes employed anywhere in the trucking industry outside of a few in the taxi industry. Wherever there were Negroes employed in any area that the union organized, they were taken into the union with equal rights with everybody else. There was no discrimination against them. And uh, I remarked, I wouldn't, I, it, it would not be uh, true to say there wasn't prejudice against Negroes on the part of the white workers for all the historic reasons that are well understood. But there was actual solidarity, at least so far as that struggle was concerned. And, uh, and uh, insofar as there were any, any Negroes present, they were few. They had full union rights and there was equality and struggle as well during the battle. Uh, I, guess I, heard, I heard that recently there are only, uh, well, 3% of the population of the United States are Negro. And uh, looking back even further on the region of the United States, what do we do now this situation? Can you speak a little louder? I can scarcely hear you. Uh, uh, first of all, in the Twin Cities, I heard the figure of 3% as being the uh, amount of the Negroes, or the percentage of Negroes in the cities. So, what I guess, what I 
reason, and he had a, a good job. But I, did, I think it's, it's important for us to remember, because this might to pop up from the nature of what's been made so much on the agenda as it, as it is today, that there was an absence of Negro people in bad terms of the old population. One. And another factor, equally as important to remember or stick a pen in, uh, is the fact that even among the few Negroes that you found in this region, in this period, they were of a, a, a little more advanced, a little further developed in their thinking as, as far as it goes, as it may be bourgeois in their thinking. But coal yard work as such was not a desirable work even among the Negroes in the Depression period. So there was no, there was no, uh, there was no pressure for, for these kinds of jobs. There was no rushing to get into a union or anything else as far as that's concerned in this particular region. And those Negroes who were the pioneers and the rooted families in the region were in the main, Negroes who had taken roots in this area as a result of the underground railroad system escaping from slavery and therefore, therefore, had uh, rooted themselves and were pretty substantial, were pretty people. I think if you would check, you would find that the, uh, the unemployed figures among, in this region alone, among the Negroes was much better than it was in the other parts of the other parts of the country. And then those that were employed were employed in terms of therefore they were kind of out. They were they, the question, the Negro question as such, did not uh, present itself in this form for these struggles that Darrell that uh Carmen Darrell was talking about. And I'm still not baiting the question that there was a prejudice that may have been yeah. some. However, I don't think that it was the same. The nature of it, because of the competition, even in an undeveloped working class for jobs, was, was entirely different. Uh, could, could I just, uh, that's a, um, a, a very good point that Comrade Jim makes. Uh, I can, I would just add that, that really it, it's, a, it's a point that should, it should be noted as, as an additional category in the, in the other points I brought up in my talk about the exceptional nature of the Minneapolis situation. Uh, you remember I pointed out that there was no basic industry there, and, and that was one of the reasons why it was an accident for the reasons I sought to describe that such a titanic battle would, it would take place there. Now, um, uh, that's a... Uh, a, uh, an important thing to observe that yes, in part, and as a matter of fact, in substantial part, insofar as there were Negroes in that part of the country, it was more a matter of people that come in the time of the Underground Railroad prior to the Civil War, whereas the the main uh, the main migration of Negroes from the South elsewhere in the country that uh, that uh, brought substantial forces of Negroes into the class struggles that developed in the in the 30s was a migration into basic industry. Uh, if I recall, one of the major waves was in the period of the First World War. Uh, uh, well, I don't know, I was going to say you would be aware of that factor in the Second World War. I keep forgetting how old I'm getting. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be so much aware of that either. That's 20 years ago too, isn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, but just as, as, had been the, as had been the case in the Second World War, there was another big wave of migration. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I think that, that, was, uh, that, was, that was the latter was the period in which the more profound of the Negro migrations in the West Coast in, in, in considerable magnitude began to take place. Whereas the migrations uh, during the First World War and in the period of the development of mass production in the succeeding years was, uh, 
more in the north and east, in the, uh, in, in the packing and auto and industries of that kind. So that, uh, that uh, in that sense, what Comrade Jim says is correct, that, uh, that for historic reasons, in this exceptional circumstance, there was, there was uh, not a, a Negro community present that, that uh, would, have, would have constituted a factor of sufficient magnitude to, to represent a, uh, a specific historic category of the struggle forces involved in the battles there. They had known Brown for some time, as I pointed out. Uh, the uh, the older, more experienced commerce at the time, like the Dunn brothers and Scogland, for example, and there were others, uh, had been in the movement, and and uh, a bit earlier had been red baited out of the the AFL. Um, Back in the uh, in the uh, Red Scare of the early twenties, uh, around the events that are known in history as the Palmer Raids, Palmer being the Attorney General of that time, uh, a somewhat less sweeping but roughly analogous version of the contemporary witch hunt was initiated and prevailed during the 20s. In the, since backlash is a popular term today, I'll say in the backlash of the Russian Revolution. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was this, uh, this, uh, this uh, witch hunt development in the 20s. And uh, uh, radicals got uh, driven out of the unions put on blacklists, oftentimes became hard for them to get a job. As a matter of fact, as somebody observed, uh, uh, I think it was you, Jim, uh, shoveling coal is not exactly the kind of a job you go out to look for, and that's not the least of the reasons that people like Scoglin and Dunn were in coal yards, because they'd been, they'd been blacklisted out of, out of other places because they were, uh, because they were uh, radicals. So they were known. Uh, in the movement and by various figures in the movement and and among others they had developed some limited acquaintance with brown who was a uh, who was a relatively young man he was in his uh, he was in his uh, 30s but it had some years of background experience in the teamsters union and in in uh, in uh, one and another post in the union movement so they knew one another they knew a little about him and uh, they had perceived that this is, was the type of a man that, although they had seen him only as part of the apparatus, he was a cut above the average stripe of the, of the faker that, uh, that uh, sat on top of the unions. And uh, so they began to probe more deeply to just see how big a cut uh, uh, he was against them, and it proved to be quite a bit. So they developed discussions with him and uh, evaluated the whole situation. As I say, he had a little above average consciousness for a trade unionist. He was just a pure and simple trade unionist, no political, former labor party, but uh, that's all of the time. But uh, he, had a little, he had a little vision. He had, a little, he had a little capacity to, uh, to uh, uh, look out beyond his navel in contemplating the, uh, the, uh, uh, what's in the best interest of the Union movement. And uh, as I say, he had a little guts. And it was, it was through the, the uh, really the three basic factors. One, that, that uh, Brown was something above the average. And as I said, could have gone one way or the other depending on what happened in life at that juncture. 
It's a very important thing, by the way, uh, as we're talking about Brown, instead of talking specifically about him for a moment, let's just take him as the, uh, as the prototype. It's a very important thing to uh, keep in mind about individuals in politics, particularly when you're dealing with the motion of social forces. Uh, you remember the uh, saying of Napoleon that every soldier has a marshal's baton in his knapsack, which was his way of indicating that under the storm and stress and, and uh, tides of the great French Revolution of 1789 and the period that followed, that, uh, that people uh, uh, who uh, didn't dream they had those capacities would get a chance to demonstrate that maybe they're a great military figure. That's putting it one way, not turn it around. Plekhanov, in dealing of the role of the individual in history, calls attention to the fact that if it hadn't been for the French Revolution, Napoleon might just as well have wound up a corporal in the French artillery. Now, it's a very important thing to understand uh, that, that uh, one or another thing happens to an individual according to what is happening in the larger forces, in the tides of human society and the class struggle that goes on around you. Um, take, take, some people can, can, uh, can live to be 60 years old in any kind of circumstances and never get as much life as another person would in 16 years in the same circumstances, but let's subtract from that and just take two people that you would say have got about the same given potential of realizing richness in life given an opportunity. And one person can live out a whole life and not too much happen. And another person can live more life in five or six years. And the difference is not, in this instance, in the people. It's in the difference it is in what is going on. Uh, put it another way. <coughs> uh, young people today have the problem of trying to grasp the revolutionary essence of the working class out of books. If you would have had an opportunity to participate in what I'm going to try to describe to you tomorrow night, you wouldn't have to open the cover of a single book to convince yourself of the revolutionary caliber of the working class. They still have to open the books but you'd open the books not to convince yourself the working class is revolutionary, but to help learn how to be an even better revolutionary fighter. And there's, a, there's another comparison in the, in the situation with the individual. Uh, Brown is one example. I'm going to give you two others, uh, uh, neither of whom was the man Brown was, but who served a certain key role at a certain key juncture in some, some uh, struggles that, uh, that are to follow later on. I think maybe as, as we go into these, it'll help to, to, to broaden this factor a little. Uh, just by way of reading matter, if you haven't done so recently, you could do, you could, uh, do well to go back and read those two pamphlets uh, of Plekhanov's about the materialist conception of history and the role of the individual in history. In the light of what we're going, we've talked about tonight and are going to talk about, it maybe has some fresh meaning to you. As long as I got the floor and the chairman hasn't stopped me, I'll just add that uh, even when you read a book, when you're reading books about particularly such profound questions as the class struggle and the, and the titanic motion of great social forces that are trying to advance human society. Don't feel because you read it once, that's that book and that's the end of it. Depending, of course, of course on, on the quality of the book. But you can read a book when you're 20 years old and go through five or six years of life and experience and open that book again and you'll wonder if you ever read it because something has happened to you in your life 
that gives much more meaning to what you read. You understand much more. You understand much more deeply than you did before. That's a very cogent point. It's a very cogent point. If, I'll put it this way, that whether directly or indirectly, but really at least by a combination of the two, where a conscious political force is giving are attempting to give leadership to a body of workers, there has to be a clear link between the political consciousness, the class struggle consciousness of the people attempting to give uh, leadership and knowledge of the industry. Uh, you, can't, you can't walk into any industry any body of workers, you can walk into any kind of a any kind of a uh, mass organization and uh, and uh, uh, pretend you've got all the answers and you're going to and you're going to give leadership and it's going to be the best of leadership and get people to listen to you and believe you, unless you know something about the situation. I see by the morning paper the National Farm Organization has got what they call a withholding action going on, doing a little picketing. You couldn't, you couldn't walk up to uh, uh, even the most responsive people there and pretend that you're going to give them all the answers about what to do next in that fight until you first prove that you can tell a hog from a goat and the northeast from the southwest quarter on a section of land and which end of a cow you milk and a few other things. You've got certain minimum proofs that you have to give. Or, uh, well, in, 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 any other, in any other sphere of struggle. That, that, that holds true. There, ha there has to be a linkage between the political class consciousness necessary to lead a struggle against the boss class and a knowledge of the environmental conditions in which the given body of workers